Hello, this is Dr. Caitlin Kite from the Academic Development Team. I am creating this video in order to provide in digital form a session that would normally be delivered face-to-face. -face. I have kept in it the activities that you would have been asked to engage in if you were sitting in the face-to-face -face session, and what I'm hoping is that you will still consider engaging in them now because they are a really good way to make sure that you get the most out of this, that you're not just sitting there bored, that you can actually think about what we're talking about in the session and remember it a bit better once the session is over. So in the hopes that you will do that, I will pause at the appropriate time so that you have a chance to pause the film and then you can engage in those activities. And then when you're ready, you can press play again and move on to the next slide or move on to the next bit of animation and discussion. So with that said, let's dive in. I'd like to start off by looking at some good news and also some bad news. Now the good news is that you already know how to tell a good story and therefore how to write a great press release. And this is because ever since you were small, you were interested in things that took a narrative form and you have had a tendency to convey information in a narrative style. And this is just because that is how humans learn language. That's how we make sense of details. This is how we tend to learn really well. And this just comes from thousands of years of evolution and living as social animals. The bad news is that we're not always really good at using that skill. That the things that we're good at as we're children, the eye that we have for these little details and the skill that we have in telling these stories is often uh, kind of beaten out of us at school. And, and we become very rigorous with certain types of formatting, certain types of language. And as a result, the stories that we tell aren't quite as interesting as they would have been, or we end up just having a list of facts rather than a proper story with a good narrative. So this session is hopefully going to help you reconnect with an ability that's already ingrained and that you can already draw on, and that will help you to then feel more comfortable writing a good press release and, and engaging with the media. I'd like to show you a couple of examples here and have you think about which one of these sounds more appealing to you and is more likely what you would say. So let's say you've met some friends in the street and you've just read something really amazing or you've learned something really amazing. Would you say, you'll never guess what, blueberries give you superpowers? Or would you say, you'll never guess what, According to recent research by scientists at the University of Exeter, consuming blueberries can give human males and females abilities which defy scientific explanation. Now, I think, probably, even though I can't see a show of hands, most of you would have selected the first one and not the second one. And yet, as researchers, the second one is what most of us tend to say when we start describing to people what we've just read in an article or when we start trying to take our own journal articles and, and transform those into something for popular consumption. Typically, by and large, and this is not necessarily true of everyone, but this is a tendency, we shy away from a more conversational approach like that first example. And this is what most people actually do talk like, even researchers in their spare time. So we need to try to tap into that style and get away from the more scientific style. Now I'd like you to take a look at these words here and see if there's anything that you feel connects these in some fashion. How do you feel about these words? And what do these words make you think of? What characteristics do they have or not have? So I think you could describe this in many different ways. Um, you might all say that these are words that you might see in a grant proposal or a journal article. You might say that these are words that you use frequently when you're having uh, lab meetings or discussing things with your collaborators. But certainly the one thing that I would suggest unites them all is that these are not typically the sorts of terms that you would say in casual conversation. So you're probably not going to go down to the pub uh, and start spouting off words like this all the time. And if that is the case, if you read something and you're looking at words and thinking that none of this is something that I would say in a normal situation out in the world, then probably you should steer clear of that sort of jargon if you're thinking about a press release, if you're thinking about 
connecting to the public if you're thinking about working with the media. So immediately, first off, you have to start filtering yourself and resetting your brain to say things in a whole new way. So how about the way that you put the words together once you have made that filter and you have gotten rid of the jargon? Well, you need to be thinking about what's going to be appealing to folks, and that will be things that affect them, things that make them feel an emotion of some sort, things that are brand new, and also things that are compelling because the narrative is keeping them hooked and, and, and in suspense. So when you're thinking about telling a story, these are the sorts of things that you want to try to use to shape your story or to include in your story. And you can see down at the bottom of the screen there a list of different most read stories. And you can see immediately where some of these probably link up to some of these bullet points above. Uh, so there's a bit of novel interest going on there. There are some things where people are feeling a bit angry, perhaps, or a bit intrigued. There are things that people might say impact them personally, and so they want to click on that. And you can see how all of these stories might become popular because they are appealing to those bullet points. Now, it's really important before we dive too far into thinking about uh, media presentations and media outlets and, and what is shown in the news, that Media really is the survival of the fittest. And if you flip back to that previous slide and you look again at those 10 stories that are listed there, and again, the fact that they align with all of those bullet point suggestions, those are things that are going to be compelling and people are going to be interested in those. And so they're going to click them over and over again, and they're going to be popular and they're going to stay in that top 10. But if something were to happen, if aliens were to show up, if a plane were to crash, if a new person were to be, were to be elected president in a very influential country, that's going to be a new story that could displace any of those things because it's going to be even more um, interesting or perhaps the storytelling might be even better. It's going to affect people even more. And so there's this constant juggle all of the time about what are the things that are going to be in that top 10 or whatever number you're looking at. And why are they there? And how long are they going to last? And no matter how compelling your particular story is, if the aliens show up on the same day, if the president is elected on the same day, if a tsunami happens, then most likely your work is going to be overlooked. And that has nothing to do with whether you told the story well. It has nothing to do with whether the jargon was removed or not. It simply has to do with the fact that there was something else that journalists were more interested in on a given day because they anticipated that readers would be more interested. And again, if readers are more interested, even if your story has gone out, then it will be drowned out. It will fall off of the website. It will be put down into a, a dark corner where no one's going to click it because that other stuff is going to be more prominent. And you never know what's going to happen. And you just have to accept that there is some uncertainty and that that will not be your fault and that you just have to go with the flow and hope that next time will be better. Or perhaps see if there's a way to repackage what you've just done and perhaps do something else with it at a later time when there's less competition. When you start preparing to interact with the media and to create a press release, one of the first things you do need to consider is who your audience is going to be. And inevitably, you're going to have to reset a little bit in terms of thinking and picturing who it is you're talking to. Most of us spending our time in higher education and doing research are picturing people about our same age who have a certain level of experience and knowledge that's like ours, who use vocabulary like ours, who are interested in the same things that we're interested in. And to be honest, you start thinking that that's just the norm. And you really quickly realize once you've left the bubble that actually the vast majority of people have different interests, have very different lives, use different vocabulary, and so on. And none of that is meant to be insulting at all. It's just to say that we see a certain thing around us all the time. And so we have a certain habit in terms of thinking that that's what the world is like and also in interacting with people in that way because it just becomes a habit. And you do have to remember that 
that is not the norm. The vast majority of people come from different demographics. They are different age groups. They have different educational backgrounds. They have different sorts of jobs, different sorts of interests. They are in different geographical locations. And what you create has to be something that tries to appeal to as wide a variety of people across all of that diversity as possible. And that's a really challenging thing. And one of the things that a lot of journalists do is just try to picture kind of like your, your Aunt Ethel. You see her here on screen. Um, so this is just maybe someone who has been around for a while, maybe is not someone who's always looking at all of the current events or traveling far and wide or aware of the most recent happenings in something. So you will need to bring them up to speed a little bit. And you may need to pitch your discussion somewhat differently because perhaps this is someone who doesn't get out and do a lot of new things all the time. There's a set routine, there's a set level of knowledge. And so you're gonna have to overcome those boundaries a little bit. So when you're thinking about how to describe your research, picture someone like this and think, where would I start if, if this is what I needed to say? And the likelihood is that if it's approachable and interesting to someone like this, then it's approachable and interesting to a wide number of people in your potential audience. Now I want to show you a real life example to give you a sense of the sort of um, overhaul that has to be done when you go to translate research writing into writing for the media. So here is an example that our press team at the university received from academics. You can see this is a study that's looking at canine cognition and they have looked at how uh, clever dogs are and they have done some comparison here and all of this sounds like the sort of thing immediately you're thinking oh the public might find this interesting people love dogs people love a David Attenborough so you could see how they'd be into the kind of animal behavior thing but all of this if you read through and look you can see this is quite um, no offense to the authors, but it's kind of boring from a lay perspective. If you are not a person in this field, you might not feel this is very compelling. There's a lot of jargon. Uh, it's, it's not a very good story necessarily, and so it's not exactly hooking you in. So how would the press team go about changing that? So here you can see that, first of all, there's a nice headline, so it's not called abstract. It's now called dog intelligence, not exceptional. And immediately people are going to start thinking, well, wait a minute, my dog is brilliant. And so they might keep reading because they want to understand this provocative statement. Or maybe they're thinking, that's right, my cat's way more intelligent or something along those lines. And so they might keep reading for that reason. So you can see either way, it's going to catch your eye and be interesting. And then Immediately, you can also see some other differences. You've got several different sections that are very short, so just one to two sentences a piece, and that's going to be much easier, much more bite size, and that will help to ensure that you at least get some messaging, even if you stop reading halfway through, which a lot of people do these days. And you can see that the descriptions are also much more simplistic and much more, again, bite size, so that you have difficult concepts that used to be several sentences now condensed down into one and certain details left out. So this is the sort of transformation that you're going to have to bring to your pieces. And a lot of people do find this quite uh, difficult because they feel that all the details are important. As researchers, we know that as soon as you leave something out, someone is going to start questioning you. And it can be quite frustrating to have to remove something entirely or simplify it early and then only describe it in detail much later on for those people to actually read all the way through. Because either way, you're thinking someone is not going to see that. But that is just the way that news works. No one will publish anything that's longer. And if you write something that's longer or formatted differently, whenever these things go out on the wire, the journalists will pick it up and they will discard it immediately. They're not going to want to go with that press release because they probably themselves won't even make their way through it. So this is unfortunately just the way we do need to format things to make them pop, to make them interesting to journalists and to audiences alike. That particular example you can see was picked up quite a bit and you can see that there are several uh, different examples here of different headlines where some are similar some are a bit different you can see again in the text some of the text is a bit different some of the text is the same so once journalists do pull this off the wire they may 
um, just basically republish the press release that you and or your press team have um, created, or they may go and ask some further questions or they may tailor it to their own formatting as they uh, desire. It really depends on how much time they have and how much interest they have. But this is the sort of thing that's the culmination, basically, of that process of changing something from an abstract into something that's more interesting and appealing for a typical audience. Now that you've seen that process happen once, let's go through it again, but with pauses inserted so that you can see how you would approach it yourself and perhaps have a chance to jot down some notes about what you might make of the story from the abstract, how you might condense that down, how you might strike out some details, rearrange it, perhaps add a title. Let's see if you are able to do what our press team would do. So here is the paper. Dietary nitrite supplementation reduces oxygen costs of low intensity exercise and enhances tolerance to high intensity exercise in humans. So that's quite a weighty title there. You can have a bit of a, a read through some of the text below and get a sense of what you think the headline might be and some of the major details that might need to be summarized. So when you're ready, you can pause this, jot down some thoughts, and then press play again to move on to the next slide. Here is the press release that our press team produced. You can see this happened back in 2009. So you might actually have seen this in the news or heard about it. It was really popular. It did really make the rounds. And this research does still pop up every now and then. And that's partly because the academics involved are still doing further work in this area, but also it is because of this original press release and this particular coverage, which just for some reason really appealed to people and spread far and wide. And you can see here the headline, Beetroot Juice Boosts Stamina, New Study Shows. So it's quite easy, much simpler than the headline of the paper itself. And you can see immediately that the first line is already thinking about how does this impact you as the reader. So drinking beetroot juice boosts your stamina and it could help you exercise. So if you're thinking about your Aunt Ethel or someone else, immediately all of that work from the abstract was translated into something that is conversationally being um, conveyed. Here is a thing that can make a difference for your life. And that's just a really nice and easy way to ease someone into a news story. And again, you can see that a lot of the wording has been simplified. A lot of the findings have been stripped down. So it's just the key headline points that drinking the beetroot juice is reducing oxygen uptake. And this is the sort of thing that you would need to do if you are uh, working on your own press release. And one of the nice points of this one, I think, as well, is that very last sentence. Um, These findings could also be relevant to elderly people or those with cardiovascular, respiratory, or metabolic diseases. So the piece takes care to point out that this is not just of interest to endurance athletes and to folks who are doing lots of exercise. Actually, it could be of interest to everyone. So again, there's the hook that shows why a wider audience should pay attention to this. Again, just to show you how this looked in the real world um, when it made headlines, you can see um, there are very similar headlines to what the press release produced, but also some different ones. You can see some of the actual wording in the articles is very similar. Other times it's been changed. So again, you never quite know what journalists are going to want to do with your piece. And it depends on whether they have um, edited what you've done and whether they have the time to do that, whether they've called you up for an interview, whether they're just going to take what you've already created in your own written press release and just reproduce that. It really depends on what else is happening on the day and how big the publication is and how many staff they have. So that just gives you an introduction into what it looks like to translate what if you actually have to start from scratch? What are the things that you need to do? Well, you may have started to get a sense of this just from looking at those last couple of examples. The main thing is that you need to start with the headline. 
the, the main findings and you just cut straight to the chase. You don't give the background, you don't describe your methodologies, you don't provide any justification, you just go straight to the point, what was the finding? And it is indeed going to be finding, singular, or maybe a couple of findings. But with most of us, we have studies where we have maybe five, six different things that we found. But you can't do that really in a press release. You have to just focus on a couple of key points and that's it. So start with that and then you can elaborate and add a few of those background details. As we've already talked about, you have to stress the relevance to the public. So they need to understand why they should care about this. And again, you can go back to what we said right at the beginning. Maybe it's because it's new. Maybe it's because it's interesting. Maybe it's because it's personally relevant to their own lives. Whatever it is, you have to make sure that you are making that really obvious from early on. We've already talked about the language, so throughout you want to reduce jargon. Now there's a lot of discussion around what does that really mean? Are you never using any scientific terms or are you using those terms but then defining them? And I would suggest that it really depends on the audience, it really depends on the exact terms, it depends on your area of work. Because we do often find that some of this language does make its way into the more common vernacular and actually people need to know what that means because they're starting to see it more and more. So it's not necessarily bad to use those words but you do need to explain what they mean and perhaps uh, use the simple language first and then do the explanation rather than the other way around which is often how we tend to do it. You also want to make sure that you're being as pithy as possible, be very concise, don't waste words because people have very limited spans of attention these days and you will lose them. So you do have to cut out as much wordage as possible and just really strip it back to the bare bones. And if people do want to know more, then perhaps you can have an infographic, you can have a video, you can have a podcast, and you can post all of those things on your website. So if they do start to look for more information, then they can find the extra stuff elsewhere. You do also want to really focus just on the story itself. So there are going to be certain things that we all have to stick in. So for example, um, who are the funding bodies? Who are the collaborators? What were all the different institutions that were involved? And so on. And all of that does have to come at the, at the end. We all do this because we are told we have to do this when we get grants and when we have collaborators. And a lot of care is taken when a press release is being developed to share it amongst all those collaborators and institutions to make sure that everyone is happy. So generally everyone has ticked off all the boxes before this goes out to press. But just make sure that if you're the one responsible for doing the first draft, you don't worry about putting all that way up at the top that's always going to be towards the bottom because to the reader it's going to be the least important stuff. It, it may be important to your collaborators or to your funders but it's not going to be important to the public. Finally of course in bold you do want to be accurate and this is partly because you of course need to um, you know make sure that you're conveying your information you don't want to mislead anyone but also you often only have this one opportunity People who see something in the media, people who hear a story on the news or read it in the paper, that often is the only time they will interact with that. So you have to get it right because it's really hard to correct something once it's out there. Now before I move on, I do just want to say that when you're doing all of this, thinking about all of these things simultaneously, Typically what you're doing in terms of actually putting this down on paper is coming up with four sentences of basics, a quotation from yourself or from one of the other researchers, a bit more info, and then a bit of housekeeping. And the housekeeping is that PR stuff at the bottom. So the funders, the official name of the study, and so on. So that's the order in which you would do it. Four sentences of basics, a quote, more info, and housekeeping. So that is the structure in which you would um, apply all of these principles. Now I'm going to ask, even though I can't see your responses, whether anyone recognizes this. Some folks might, but it might be so old that other folks don't. So this is um, a TV news site, CFAX, and it's kind of like a wire service that you would click onto. And here you would find that headlines would be no more than 39 characters long because there's a crunch, there's only so much space there. And that meant that the headliners had to be punchy and they can only run on basically one line. And this is a technique that is still used today actually. All the paragraphs here 
are only 20 words and no more, so they're only usually four or five paragraphs, and everything basically had to be really succinct, to the point, everything people needed to know in 120 words. And again, this is all stuff that still influences our thinking and our approach today. The BBC still used the 39 characters rule, for example, for their uh, online headlines, and it's really good practice. But what all of this really emphasizes, and I think the graphic does help to do that because you can see it in front of you, is that you do have to keep things short. You do have to keep things punchy and you really can't waste your words because as soon as something starts to go on for too long, people will start feeling like they're bored, they need something else, they've got as much information as they need and they just won't pay attention. So you have to work really hard to craft everything into just the right format that's going to get across everything that needs to get across really quickly before someone moves on. Those of you who are already active in Twitter might have found that actually that is something that can really help you to engage in this sort of um, pithy, punchy, concise sort of writing. And this is why it can be actually really helpful to engage in social media, even if you're thinking, well, this is a, a waste of time, people are just talking about personal stuff, it's not good for professional use, and so on. Actually, even if it's just looking at Twitter every now and then to get a sense of how people do things, that will be really beneficial to you. Because actually, it's quite hard to really concisely, but also in a really interesting way, convey a lot of information in just a little bit of space. And even if you don't want to use social media yourself, you could think about just practicing and giving yourself only 140 characters or 280 characters, only a certain number of words to convey certain thoughts. And this is something that we kind of do when we're writing abstracts for um, conferences or for papers or when we're starting to put together titles for our papers, but we only do that every so often and we don't do it for the general public most of the time. So working on something like Twitter or setting yourself up with those constraints yourselves can be really beneficial and I definitely recommend it. I have certainly found that this is something that has helped me to rethink how I communicate and certainly engaging with Twitter conferences and Twitter um, outreach and teaching events has been something that's been especially helpful because that is the same sort of thing actually only you've got guaranteed live feedback with an audience right there so you can immediately get a sense of whether you're doing a good job with these techniques or not. Now I want to walk you through a visual of how this whole process looks from beginning to end. And this is not just um, the kind of quick and easy sorts of screenshots that I showed you earlier, but this is the whole thing. So here is a block of text, and you can pause this if you'd like to read this block of text before I go on. Um, but I'm gonna animate the next few screens. And basically what I'm gonna show you is the change that something needs to go through once you've started to extract all the information from your abstract and put it into kind of a more palatable format for the public, there's still quite a lot of work in terms of what most of us need to do to structure it differently and reorganize things. So that's what I want to show now. So here you can see the headline has popped up away from the rest of the text. changing the text so we don't have a big block, we're just having shorter one to two sentences per paragraph. Okay, so now we have separated out all the different bits of this. And you can see already that this is much more readable because it's not one big block of text. It's several little bite-sized things which you can see would be more comfortable to read and perhaps also more interesting because each topic um, is separated out so you're able to really think about it a little bit more and start to connect the story. However, there are still some issues. Again, if you've read all this, and if you haven't, I would suggest you do that now, you might have had some thoughts about what the actual headline is and where it's located within this and where are the salient points and are they actually pulled together. So I'm now going to advance and um, animate it a little bit more so we can have an inspection of that.
All right, so here you can see four major points, two of them towards the beginning, two of them towards the end. All of these are really important, and, and this basically here is your narrative. So we've got the, the kind of arc of the story here, but it's been spread out and buried. And clearly this is not what you would want in a, an actual press release and an actual news story, and so you would need to rearrange things. And in fact, what you could do is take those four key points and put them all into a single sentence that summarizes what the overall finding was of this paper and of this research. So then what that means is that you can start to rearrange the original and make it something that's much more palatable and much more helpful. Now we are looking at something that a reader could actually extract something from. So it's going to probably um, pull their attention. It's going to make them read all the way through. It's going to make sense as they go. And this is going to be something that's much more likely to be signed off by the press team and actually sent out to the media. What's also important is to ensure that there's a quote at some point. So this is often a thing that uh, people who are, even people who are good at doing science communication and, and communicating their research, they aren't used to thinking about quotations. They just want to explain because they are the experts. So the whole thing is basically a quotation from them. But in um, the media, you do actually need to have a quotation. The media will always look for a bit of an interview, even if that interview is in written form. So if you are preparing something, you will want to put in at least one statement that you have made as a quotation. And you might even go out to some of your co-authors, your colleagues, and get some quotations from them as well. And the, the media, if they are following up on a story, as you probably have seen, they will send out papers in advance and try to get a quote from another expert to have it independently verified. They may also look for someone who disagrees and try to get a quotation from them. And so you might find yourselves uh, being asked about that process or being consulted as part of that process and you should know in advance that that will happen and anything that you can do to already provide that information may be quite helpful. So here you can see uh, that this is a way that you could replace what is a statement with a quotation instead or have a statement that then leads into a quotation like this one as you see here. Some additional concerns include the following. Uh, the first is having some really good images, and these are both still and moving. So photos and videos both can be great. And actually, I find that it's really good to have images of your research anyway. They're really helpful when you're putting together conference presentations and infographics. They're good in your dissertation. They can be really handy for your academic papers. So there's no reason why you wouldn't also then want to be able to take advantage of that and use it for any outreach and media work that you do. And that's especially true if you've got something that is uh, very complex, and so having some sort of image would help describe it, or if it's just really interesting. So if you've got a really funny or unique or exciting animal behavior, for example, as shown by the shark here, you don't want to just describe that, you want to show it. So if you've got something really dramatic happening, you want to be able to give people that image. And in fact, as they're scrolling through, if they see that image, that might capture their attention in the way that a headline wouldn't. And so you can pull them in when you would not have otherwise. Having videos is also really helpful um, as a supplementary sort of thing. So we do often release press releases where you will describe, here's something that happened, and here is this video that sits alongside it. And we see increasingly that news services will actually put the two side by side online in their reporting. A really good example of this was when the Japanese researchers saw um, the, the deep sea squid and it came up into the harbor and they had these wonderful images of the squid um, swimming around in the harbor. And so the story itself was actually relatively short. It's just basically that the squid had been seen, but then that was accompanied by this fantastic video. And the video really was the bulk of the story. So you could think about doing that sort of thing as well. 
case studies and human interests are also fantastic. And this kind of relates to the points that I made early on in the presentation. But one of the things that's nice about this is that these are the sorts of things that can be intriguing and compelling, even if, if you haven't completely finished your work yet. So to date, through this talk, we've been talking about taking a journal article and turning that into a press release. But it's also true that there are just things that come up and people want to know more information. They don't need to know about a study, they just want to know what you have inside your head. And so at that point, you could think about taking your knowledge and turning that into a case study. So for example, uh, at Christmas and at Halloween, we have researchers that do research that's kind of topical for those times of year and those holidays. And so they are contacted by the press to make comments about um, witches or about cold weather or about flying reindeer or whatever. And so even though these are things that are not studies, they are able to take their knowledge and turn that into human interest stories or to provide case studies that kind of explain why is this thing happening or how is this going to work? So you could think about whether your research would allow you to do that as well. One other thing I do want to mention is that with a lot of this work, there can be incredibly frustrating long lead times and embargoes that are on papers. So you will have um, your paper accepted in a journal. You'll turn around and tell the press team that and you will work together on the press release. But then the journal itself doesn't publish that article until um, weeks or months later, hopefully not years. Uh, and this is getting better than it used to be because we do often do the online publication prior to the print publication, but at the same time it can take a really long time. So what you want to be doing is using that time wisely and not just throwing together a press release right at the last minute, the day before something is to come out. You want to do that as far in advance as possible because then the embargoed release will go out to the press and they will then have their own time, um, a few days or a couple of weeks, to put together their own responses or make their own pieces and they might contact you for an interview, contact the other people and so on as I mentioned previously. And that gives them time to then do that the way that they would like in order to cover it the way that they would like so that when it finally does come out, it's perhaps a bit fuller than it might have been. It's more eye-catching. It's more um, timely because it's been tailored to fit that particular day and that particular news cycle and not just, um, not just the press release that you put together several months ago. So it's just worth keeping in mind that that's what the process is like and that you will need to work within um, those boundaries as you proceed. Now, a lot of people do feel really uncomfortable talking to the media, and I think that is worth acknowledging and tackling head on. And the way to do that is to think about what advantages are there to talking about the media. So I'm going to invite you now to pause the video and just think, what would be helpful for you in talking to the media? What could you get out of it? What could your colleagues get out of it? What could your institution get out of it? What are the benefits? And when you've come up with your list, you can go to the next slide and see what I think are some of the answers. This is probably not uh, an extensive list that lists every single thing, but these are certainly some really key points and hopefully some good selling points to why you should talk to the media. You definitely can start to have an impact on the public by getting the findings of your work out there to them. By doing that, you can raise your own profile, so that helps you to uh, promote your own research, and that in turn can help you get some collaborators and perhaps uh, secure some funding. And often people do want to see your impact and your engagement whenever you are putting together a grant proposal. So you can use this sort of thing as evidence that you have these skills and you do do this work. If you're interested, when you are um, doing all of this work, you can do it in a way that is impactful for the government. So it's not just um, everyone out in the public, it's also key members of the public, those who are making decisions as part of the government. So that can be really helpful. Doing all of this as well is good for the organization, which can have knock-on effects for you. You can use these sorts of uh, experiences to make people aware of what you're doing so that they will come to perhaps events that you're running or sign up for a study that you have designed or give you some feedback that you might need. So there can be some really good community engagement that again is good for your impact that you might need to write into your funding, but also it's quite good for your own research and it's just a nice thing to do. So that might make you feel good as well. 
Finally, I think it's really important for just ensuring that people understand what's out there and they understand how the process of research works. They understand what's going on in higher education and it perhaps might raise some aspirations and make people think, well, I want to do that. I want to help with that. How can I get involved with this as well? So there's a lot of public good that can come out of speaking to the media. One of the reasons why a lot of researchers don't want to is that they have some preconceptions about how journalists work and what the process is going to be like and the problems that inevitably will emerge. Three of these key ones are that journalists are going to misrepresent them in some fashion. So either by misunderstanding or um, twisting the words, a lot of this happens around kind of the process of sensationalization. So thinking that what you're talking about is going to be um, sexed up, jazzed up in some fashion that is ludicrous and kind of embarrassing to you and really misses the point. People are also worried that the science will be dumbed down. So all of that uh, that we talked about earlier about extracting certain details and not having certain amounts of information and certain types of jargon, some researchers do find that really problematic because to them it's not making something more accessible, it's making something dumber and stripping out actually all of the work that you put into this and all the expertise that you had to have to do this. And finally, probably because of these two things, people are worried as well that the relevance of the work will be lost. That in creating a sensational headline and taking out the details, a story is going to be made just to sound like a soap opera and it's not going to be anything that actually reflects the real value of it and gives people a sense of how they can actually use this information. So what can we do um, to make you feel better that this is not going to happen? And, and what can you do to try to understand the media better so that you can proactively work against these sorts of things before they might even emerge? Well, I think the answer to that question is that you need to understand what it is that journalists want. So to some extent, for sure, they do want the truth. Uh, and I know that People think that journalists are just out there for a good headline. And of course, journalists need a good headline because that's how the news works. If people aren't looking at a headline and clicking on it, then people aren't getting traffic to their websites and journalists won't have a job. So to some extent, of course, they do uh, need something to look appealing. But no journalist wants to get in trouble for not publishing the truth. No real journalist does. And there are you know, moral obligations. There are legal obligations. And so no one wants knowingly to run a story that is not accurate, that is not truthful. And so even though they might want to take some liberties, they do want to tell the truth. They just want to tell it in a way that they know will ensure that people actually engage with what it is that they're putting out there. They do also understand the importance of a, tr of a good story, and so they are going to want to tell a good story. They're going to want to figure out who are the main characters, what is the setting, what are the themes, um, what's the arc here, what's the hook, is there a cliffhanger? And in doing that, they are going to rearrange your information in the same way that we showed earlier in this video. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because that will inherently make it a bit more accessible and fun and appealing to people. So just because they're rearranging things doesn't mean that they're actually going to take away the facts or make it less valuable. It is true that they may want a bit of controversy because that, again, will lead to clicks, it will lead to viewership, it will lead to people wanting to know the next thing. Um, so it's true that there might be some extent to which they will want to find the opposing opinion and they may want to find the holes. And if you go in there knowing that, then you can proactively address those points. And I think actually as academics and researchers, a lot of us do this anyway because we are used to people looking for the thing that we don't know or the thing that we haven't seen. So you can just carry over that technique and see if you can proactively lock down your details and provide all the information and so um, kind of keep people from poking those holes in and creating a controversy where there isn't one. They may also want to kind of um, put a spotlight on things and 
and try to highlight certain things that seem to be emerging to them as a topic that's of interest, or uh, what's this one little detail here that I want to pinpoint? Someone else over there mentioned that. Let's look into that in a bit more detail. They might want to put certain things in the background because they don't think it's going to be very important or it's not going to sell your story. And they might also want to then start creating these contrasts between one thing and another thing. And all of this might not quite be how you would have told that story and how you would have uh, would have approached this. But that is just what they're doing because they're seeing uh, a wider variety of stories. They've told many stories before. They know what else their publication is going to run. And so they're trying to make connections or bring something out so it stands out from the crowd a bit more. And they are going to perhaps just do that in a way that you would not have anticipated. But that's what's driving it. It's not because they're trying to misrepresent you. It's because they are trying to get the most out of a particular story. Finally, journalists will often contact you, even if this is not your particular press release that they're looking at, simply because they want a human. They want the expert voice. They like the quotations. They know that people respond well to that. And that's especially true if it is your work. They do want to hear directly from you. What drove you to do this? Why was it interesting? How did you think of this? What will you do now? And they want that personal narrative because their readers and their viewers and their listeners respond to that personal narrative, as I've said before. And so it's really helpful to include that because that is something that people care about and they therefore want to ensure that that is a part of what they are preparing. If you are speaking with journalists off the cuff and you're having an interview of some sort, it is really key to prepare as much as you can. And you might not be able to prepare um, for a particular thing, if it happens really quickly and someone calls you up and on the spot you have to answer, so be it. But over the course of your career, you can prepare little by little. You can get the skills that you need so that any at any time you are able to feel comfortable. And actually, I find that this is not too dissimilar to the sort of preparation you would need to do to respond to questions at a conference or questions in a lecture theater or to the sorts of discussion that you might have during a Viva, for example. So actually, you do have some of these skills. You just need to build on those and put a little bit of a twist on them so that they're useful in this particular context. To whatever extent you can, it's quite helpful to know about who is it that's talking to you and what is the context. So what's the show? Uh, what is the particular focus? What are they going to be asking you about? How long do you have? Because that's going to shape the narrative that you tell. That's going to shape how many words you use, what sorts of words you use, um, where you're pitching it, and so on. You also need to know the format. Are they going to ask you lots of questions and so you're going to need to have really quick little answers? Are they going to let you speak at length? Is it just going to be one opportunity for you to talk or are there going to be um, multiple opportunities through a give and take? What's that going to look like? Are they going to go around to different experts and then come back to you in turn or are you the only person? Take as much time as you have to prepare. Think of all the questions that you feel might come up and think of your answers. Come up with your bullet points so that you know what can you come back to again and again. Just like what I was saying in the previous slides about um, thinking up what the holes might be so that you can plug those gaps and, and preemptively prevent people from asking you anything that you don't want to talk about or asking you something in a way that you don't want to address, see if you can address stuff before it comes up. So if you anticipate that someone is going to ask about uh, why was your sample size so low or why did you interact with this particular group and not that one, it's much better if you can just state what you want to state in your own terms from the beginning so it looks like you're in control and so that you can say it exactly how you want to say it before it's even questioned. So that makes you look really confident and puts you in charge. And on a related note to, to that and also to having taken that time to prepare and come up with your bullet points, you always do want to have your kind of top line. So at the end of the day, this is the thing that people need to 
go away with. And this is what politicians will often find. You'll, you'll see their talking points that no matter what questions they'll ask, they'll be asked, they'll come back to this one talking point. And that's what you need to try to do. So you want to have your various topics that you think might come up and how you're going to address them. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to have this one key thing that if nothing else, people will remember when they walk away from it. And if you've got that already, then no matter what someone throws at you, you can fall back on these things that you've prepared. And definitely, if you can, write them down, because then if you're worried about actually thinking of it on the spot, you don't have to. It's already in front of you. Now I'd like to give you a quick task so that you can try to put all of this into action. So on the next slide, I'm going to bring up a summary. So read that summary and think about what headline you would use in order to catch readers' attention and describe that story. Then you can come up with a first paragraph, as you can see here, that summarizes the findings. And then, if you were the researcher, think about what quote you think that they should say. So from a researcher's um, standpoint, feeling like they're being interviewed, what's their top line, their talking point that they would want to get across? So this allows you to put into action all the things that we've been talking about here over the past few slides. So read the summary, think of the headline, think of the first paragraph, and then come up with a quote. And when you are ready for that, you can advance the slides. I'm not going to talk, so you can just have some time there to look at it. And when you're finished, I will show you what actually was produced. Hopefully you've had a chance to come up with your headline and your paragraph and your quotation. Now you can see here what was actually produced by the press team working with uh, academics at the university. And this again is another press release that you may have seen because this is another one that did really well. It caught a lot of attention and was um, publicized quite a bit. One of the things that did make this one, and also the, the beetroot juice one that I showed earlier, really popular, is that these were things that had one or more of the following elements. They were topical, relevant, unusual, timely, and or human. And if you were quick at acronyms, you might have noticed that if you take the first letter of each of those words, it spells out the word truth. So you can use that in order to remember the characteristics that a lot of successful stories tend to have. So again, I'll repeat that. They're topical, they're you know current, newsworthy, popular. They're relevant, so this means that they're applicable to people, they seem pertinent and related to their lives. They're unusual, so they might be a bit quirky or extraordinary or curious or different, so I would say this one is kind of quirky. They're timely, so they're, they're happening at a, a certain time that's quite uh, appropriate. So for example, uh, if you're thinking about the Halloween or the Christmas time, you can see where those would be quite timely if you've suddenly got a story about witches or about flying reindeer, for example. And finally, they're human. So this is something that general or ordinary, regular people or readers would um, find appealing or relevant to their own lives. It just seems like something that is um, personal to them and engaging for them. And again, keep in mind that not every paper is going to generate these headlines, and that is partly because of the news cycle, but it's also true that sometimes things are interesting only to certain groups. And again, that's not to say anything negative about your own particular work. It's just that some things will have broad appeal and some won't. So it may be the case that whereas one paper is really great for international appeal, something else will be more national, something might be local, or something is going to be only interesting to the trade press or onto uh, the university's website. So don't feel offended if that's the case, if that's what the press team are suggesting. That's simply because they know that certain stories will have certain appeal and other stories won't. And that that appeal might be specific to a particular genre or particular medium and not all across all the different media. And that's something that you just have to get good at anticipating 
And some of that is a bit instinctive. And so if you don't develop that yourselves, that's why the press team is there to help advise you. The Magpie coverage, just to kind of give you a, a sense of this, is something that got local, national, and international coverage. And you can see why that might be, because it, it is um, quirky, as we said, but it's also um, relevant to some extent, where because people know about this saying about magpies stealing shiny things, and it's also kind of human, because people might personally feel interested in that, or have been told that by a grandmother, or something along those lines. So it's hitting mo multiple of those points, and the more of those things that something is hitting, the more likely probably it is to have a wide appeal, and to make it um, to these different formats. Now, if you find as you're approaching the process of press releases or working with the media that you are feeling out of your depth and you would like some advice and some assistance, you should always feel free to contact the press office. You can see here their information. Um, they are available to help you at any time and they can give you advice on whatever it is you're doing, whether that's a press release, uh, an article that you're going to post in a magazine, whether that's an, a news interview on the radio or on television, and so on. So they can give you some really good advice and assistance. They can help hook you up with training if you feel that you need some bespoke support in feeling more comfortable with these things, and they can give you feedback and work with you to produce whatever outputs you need. And finally, the last point that I would make is just to come back to where we were at the very beginning. Although some of the topics that we covered here and some of the techniques might have been new to you, ultimately you do have within you the skill that you need to do this sort of work. And that is, as I said at the very beginning, being able to tell stories. And we can all tell stories. We all tell stories to our friends and our families when we're just talking about what our day was like or something funny that happened on the way to work and so on. And those skills that you use there are the same skills that you would apply to talking to your research in order to translate that for the media and for a wider audience. And so there's no reason why you can't figure out how to adapt that skill to this particular context. And maybe you already have, and you can just keep getting better at it, and you can give some advice to colleagues. And if that is the case, we would love to hear. And also, if that's not the case and you're feeling uncertain, we would love to have uh, further questions. So you are more than welcome to get in touch if you have comments, if you have feedback, if you have some advice that you think we didn't cover here, and also if you have any further questions that you would like to have answered. You'll also find that there are several other videos in a series about different types of communication, so you might want to consult those and see if those have any interesting information for you. And you are more than welcome to get in touch with either the press team or me, and you will find our contact details posted with this video.